information regarding the rehabilitative approach to the patient who has had myocardial infarction. And I would like to address it in five particular areas. The clinician, I think, would be well advised to address limitation of the adverse consequences of the acute hospitalization, both physiologic and emotional, particularly a new feature of the 1980s, and that is risk stratification the identification of those patients likely to have a proximate coronary event because there are now interventions by which we can limit at least some of these. Then the feature that is common to the care of all chronic illnesses, and that is the medical and the surgical therapy that is instituted in an effort to limit symptoms and improve functions. After that, because this particular chronic illness is atherosclerotic coronary heart disease, Risk modification does become an important component simply because we now have good data that we can at least arrest the progression and hopefully induce regression of some of the atherosclerotic lesions. And finally, the area that had been peculiar to the rehabilitative approach for many years, and that is the maintenance and enhancement of residual function, function considered physiologic, psychosocial, and vocational, and I will address each of these briefly and serially. We have learned over the years that protracted bed rest has deleterious consequences, there is a limitation of physical work capacity, and this perception by patients that they are weak and tired often leads to psychological invalidism. We have learned that patients at strict bed rest become hypovolemic. They lose 7, 800 cc's of circulating blood volume, and that is associated with orthostasis and with reflex tachycardia. We have further learned that activity as low level is allowing patients to sit in a chair several times a day, more the orthostatic challenge than actually the level of activity can limit this hypovolemia, and by so doing, can not only limit these deleterious consequences, but can decrease the risk of thromboembolism. This is because when blood volume decreases, plasma volume decreases preferentially and increases blood viscosity. By limiting the hypovolemia, we limit thromboembolism. Important is that with strict bed rest, there is a decrease in muscle mass and muscular contractile strength much more evident when an arm or a leg is immobilized in a cast, not as grossly evident when the entire individual is immobilized. But inefficiently contracting muscle demands more oxygen for any given task, a feature not desirable in the setting of recent myocardial infarction. Well, what's happened is that we have instituted early ambulation programs. We have learned that we can monitor these in terms of a number of features. We've learned that low-level physical activity should not reduce symptoms, not pain, dyspnea, palpitations, or fatigue. We've learned that usually there should not be an excessive tachycardia with low-level activity. And as we live in an increasingly beta block world, we have to have some guidelines for patients on reasonable beta blockade. And what we tend to see is that usual early ambulation low-level activities should not increase heart rate more than about 20 beats above resting level. We've learned to watch for dysrhythmias, for ECG evidence of ischemia, but perhaps one of the more important features is that we've learned that since systolic blood pressure normally increases slightly with activity, that there is a very important prognostic feature to a drop in systolic blood pressure. This essentially signifying ischemia-induced ventricular dysfunction and a very adverse sign. Early ambulation is an accepted component of care today. It has had documented safety. It can prevent the deconditioning. It limits thromboembolism. Very important, as I expect Dr. Hackett has addressed, is that returning individuals to activity, which is a component of being alive, limits their anxiety and depression. This does not shorten the hospital stay, but it enables the shorter hospital stay that is medically indicated. It is an enabler of pre-discharge exercise testing because the majority of studies that have documented the predictive accuracy and indeed the safety of pre-discharge testing have been done on patients who have had progressive ambulation. 
Because patients have not become either physiologically or emotionally deconditioned, they have an improved functional status of discharge from the hospital. And in those societies where there has been an adequate employment level in which it could be tested, it was associated with an earlier and more complete return to work. Dr. Larry Weed, who many of you will recognize as the father of the problem-oriented medical record, tells us also that the most powerful of all medical and paramedical personnel is the patient. Highly motivated, not costing anything, even willing to pay. And there is one for every member of the population. And in a sense, he is presenting a challenge to the medical care system for failing to adequately teach and train this very important member of the healthcare team. And that indeed is what we try to do with the educational programs that are done in hospital, in our offices, in our clinics, and in hospital and out of hospital programs. And what has been seen is that an adequate educational program can limit the patient's feeling of being lost and helpless and limit their anxiety. It can improve confidence in a successful outcome improve their ability to cope with the problems of illness and the problems that we present by recommending alterations in lifestyle, and most important, seems associated with an improved adherence to the medical regimen. What is it that we have to teach? It is complex, and it really will require some organization to accomplish this, particularly with the shortened hospitalization secondary to DRGs. I was over in Dr. Waldo's home area of Alabama, and I learned there a new definition of DRGs, and it was called the revenues bond. <laughs> Back to the educational curriculum. The educational curriculum that we should give to patients involves teaching them a little bit about the way their heart works, a little bit about atherosclerosis, so they will understand our emphasis on risk reduction, what happens with infarction, emphasis on healing, and dispelling some of the myths about reinfarction, not being able to raise your left arm, and the like. It is important that we spend time with each activity that has a prescriptive component, be it activity resumption in terms of prescriptive activity, of return to sexual activity, of return to work, recommendations for control of risk factors, details of medications, why they are taken, what they should be expected to do, the area that patients tell us is most problematic, that they do not understand the plans over the next several weeks, their response to new or recurrent symptoms, and basically what are available in the community in terms of rehabilitative resources. Let me go now to risk stratification, because that is new for the 1980s. And what we have been able to do with time is to define certain clinical and laboratory characteristics that put patients at increased risk. I'd like to go over these with you and then show you how I formulate them in an approach to the patient. We certainly know that patients with ventricular dysfunction manifest in many ways are at increased risk, as are patients with angina prior to or following myocardial infarction, as evidence of myocardium in jeopardy. We know that as in other subsets of patients with coronary disease, older age, hypertension, and smoking increases the risk. And of course, those individuals who have incurred an episode of sudden death are at increased risk. Now, there are laboratory characteristics. And as the ECG abnormalities progress from repolarization abnormalities to Q waves to conduction defects, these are associated with more ventricular dysfunction, hence higher risk. If ambulatory electrocardiography is done and there is ventricular ectopy and evidence of ischemia, symptomatic or not, this is associated with increased risk. But particularly the exercise test data, because at pre-discharge testing, the earlier the onset, the greater the extent, and the greater the duration of ischemic changes into recovery, the higher the risk of the patient. Put very simply, this low-level challenge producing ischemia suggests that it is likely to occur when the patients do their low-level activity once they return home. Indeed, Dr. Bruce's group has shown very elegantly that a low exercise capacity certainly increases risk. And at low level exercise, if there is an inappropriate heart rate or blood pressure response, angina develops, ventricular ectopy, or clinical evidence of ventricular dysfunction, S3, mitral regurgitant murmur, ectopic impulse on the chest, this is the high risk group. And I'll show you in a moment how I use these data. 
And if we go to invasive studies, we are all aware that the increased number of proximally obstructed arteries and the lowered ejection fraction also identify a population at increased risk. I'm just showing you the formulation, and then I will show you the details of the slide as I break it down, because this one is a disaster. But it is simply to show you that what I do is to have an approach to patients with complicated and uncomplicated infarction, about half of patients in a coronary unit falling into each area, and I will show you now each half of the slide one at a time. Four patients with complications of infarction. The two that concern me most in terms of prognosis are those who have had recurrent pain and those with ventricular dysfunction. In patients with recurrent angina, medicated at rest in the unit, this signifies myocardium in jeopardy, and all other things being equal, angiography is warranted to see if that is an area of myocardium that can be salvaged rather than remaining at risk. For patients with ventricular dysfunction, I've chosen rather arbitrarily to use an ejection fraction of 30% since that is the cut point used in most studies in the literature. Should you choose to use 25 or 30%, you will hear no argument from me. But in general, with a low ejection fraction and diffuse hypokinesis, these patients often are not surgical candidates. Then their major acute risk is arrhythmia, and therefore the test procedure likely to be most yielding is the ambulatory electrocardiogram that may enable specific therapy. But for those patients who have an adequate ejection fraction, exercise testing, pre-discharge, often helps in clinical decision making and is a relatively inexpensive decision making screening test. Without evidence of early ischemia, it is appropriate to initially treat these patients medically and then evaluate them as the clinical situation evolves. With early evidence of ischemia at testing, with myocardium in jeopardy at low level activity, angiography is appropriate. And for those patients who've not read the book and didn't know they were supposed to have either a definite negative or positive test and who give us an equivocal response, it is in that setting that I choose to use the more expensive radionuclide-based techniques because often these can be helpful in making that clinical decision. But remember, the complicated patients are all somewhat at increased risk. Our major challenge is with the patients with uncomplicated infarction. How are we to separate out the 5 or 10 or possibly in some settings even 15% of individuals at increased risk from the huge majority of patients who are likely to do well despite what we do or do not do? And my approach has been this. For those patients who are elderly, and this is physiologically rather than chronologically elderly, or whose serious associated disease appears more serious and more life-threatening than does their atherosclerotic coronary heart disease, I expect medical therapy is appropriate. At the other extreme, for very young patients, of course that age gets a little bit older every year, but particularly those whose occupational or recreational preference involves high-level physical activity, I believe that probably the most cost-effective approach in terms of decision-making is coronary arteriography. Not that I am definitely going to send any or all of these patients to surgery, but I think knowledge of the specific coronary anatomy helps with long-term plans. It is for the large majority in the middle where the exercise testing is of value using the same formulation as previously in that no early ischemia, medical therapy, early ischemia, and angiography, and the equivocal ones perhaps some help from the radionuclide-based procedures. Why is it important, and why are we so interested in risk stratification now when we really were not a decade or so ago? And the reason is that we have data in terms of survival. And there are now three studies, one in the US and two abroad, that show that for patients who are suitable for their use with QA myocardial infarction, beta blockade improves survival, although we are concerned because we do not know the mechanism of this improvement, and we are also concerned at the application because very many patients must be treated to benefit a few. We also know that there is improvement in survival with coronary bypass surgery, certainly with left vein disease, with triple vessel disease, and based on the European data, with double vessel, if one is a proximal left anterior descending before the first septal perforator, particularly in the setting of ventricular dysfunction. Important in that so many of our therapies that we use have not been documented to improve survival, 
Since I made up the slide, Dr. Barb Roberts at the recent ACC meeting presented a multi-center study of the use of diltiazem in patients with non-Q wave infarction, showing that in that trial, this is the first documentation of a calcium entry blocker improving survival. Now, this is the management of all chronic illnesses, improvement in symptoms and improvement in function. And most of our medical therapy, be it with nitrate drugs, beta blocking drugs, or calcium blocking drugs, is designed to decrease myocardial oxygen demand, indeed, as is exercise training. And the exercise training that we usually do for most middle-aged adults still has as its goal decreasing myocardial oxygen demand. Coronary bypass surgery, on the other hand, improves myocardial oxygen supply by increasing blood supply, and obviously angioplasty does the same. This is the reason why the surgical approaches have a greater improvement in angina, and indeed greater abolition completely of pain in the absence of medication, and indeed better exercise performance in that not only is angina obviated as the end point, but the ischemia-induced ventricular dysfunction is limited. That's the good news part, but the bad news is that at least for saponous vein grafts, this is a temporary measure. And between probably six and 11 years, the angina begins to return and the dysfunction begins to return due both to progression of the atherosclerosis in the native circulation and to atherosclerosis in the graft vessels. Interestingly, the internal mammary arteries seem entirely different with little to no atherosclerosis, at least over the first decade. We don't know what's going to happen subsequent to that, and that has obviously changed significantly some of the surgical approaches. But the fact is that we must do something else in addition to this temporizing measure if we want to really rehabilitate patients over the long term. And this is why I think both for medically and surgically managed patients, it is important to institute efforts to limit atherosclerosis. And I require far fewer substantive unequivocal data for interventions that are inexpensive, non-risky, than I do for those that are the converse. And therefore, I am quite enthusiastic about this entire multifactorial approach, even though probably the firmest data are available for cigarette smoking cessation. But I think this is the package that we must recommend to patients after myocardial infarction and indeed after the surgical approach to ischemic heart disease. This is a favorite slide of mine <laughs> given to me by Dr. Peo Ostrand, and I'm not sure whether this gentleman is trying to decrease his risk more by his jogging or by his attention to HDL. But I perhaps have some concern that jogging for so many years has been the paradigm of rehabilitative physical activity, where for many middle-aged adults, there may be a much more suitable activity from an Atlanta newspaper, cardiac walkers, the new gang cruising the malls, simply because we use our community facility, facilities creatively. We recommend that our patients exercise in the temperature and humidity controlled shopping malls before, they, before the store is open and shortly thereafter. Now, I think it is important to realize that prescriptive exercise training, as you've heard so elegantly from Dr. Franklin, is the hallmark of rehabilitative physical activity. You've heard that it is important to train both the arms and legs. You've heard very well the exciting features that medicated patients and indeed patients with ventricular dysfunction can be trained and can improve their functional capacity. Again, for patients at the level, intensity, and duration of training typical for middle-aged adults, the training effect is on the periphery rather than on the heart, and it is such that it decreases myocardial oxygen demand. But because patients function farther from their ischemic threshold at any usual level of activity, they describe improved endurance and improved stamina. You've heard that functional capacity should be the appropriate holy grail, if you will, of exercise training, not a change in coronary lesions or in myocardial perfusion. And I'm really not terribly happy with the pooling of all the studies that has been done. Statisticians are a funny group. Dr. Cannell has called them standard deviants. And essentially what they do is that they tell you you can't pool the studies because they're different, and then they pool the studies and write papers about them. I don't 
particularly. You've also heard Dr. Franklin very well present the data on risk modification, so I shall not repeat it. But it is important that there is a major beneficial psychological effect of exercise, and this bears importance because more patients after infarction are indeed impaired by emotional than by physiologic consequences. And I do want to address these in the last few minutes. I'm sure that Dr. Hackett has addressed that anxiety is initially realistic, that the appropriate denial is fine because patients seem to do better. The inappropriate denial, when the morning after admission they tell you that they only stayed in the unit so that you would get a good night's sleep and they're about ready to go home, that probably is not associated with a favorable outcome. But depression is what we are concerned with. And we perhaps can intervene here by showing patients early on, before this becomes a fixed idea, that they can perform in their former roles as a spouse and as a parent, as a worker. Although I don't subscribe completely to the type A characterization, these individuals who are the time pressure oriented, who are the people used to being in control, do poorly in a dependent role in a coronary unit get them out of the unit as rapidly as possible, and I find they do poorly with sedation. These are people who need awareness of themselves and of their surroundings, and I find that sedation in these individuals just accentuates their problem. It is important that we recognize some of the mechanisms that may reinforce depression and try to combat them, and we've done that in much of our planning. We limit the bed rest, they are not weak. We tell the families, let them return to their normal pre-illness family role and try to live at that. We must do much in the community to see that communities will appropriately accept the activities that can be done by patients after infarction. The concern is that this is the area of invalidism where patients essentially withdraw from a useful life. Please remember that much of our standard plan of care addresses some of this. The initial information and orientation to the unit and the preparation for transfer. Think of the CCU delirium we used to see that really is gone now that we're doing some very appropriate orientation. Patients who are involved in planning for recovery, the early ambulation, the appropriate teaching, and then as we have had an abbreviated hospitalization, the post-hospital programs re-emphasizing what was previously done in hospital all also are important features that enhance psychosocial status. I have the last two minutes I'm going to address vocational concerns because that is a responsibility that government in this decade has given to the medical care system. Not only do we have to get patients well, but we have to get them back to work because our medical care is so expensive. I'm not sure I really follow this line of reasoning, but I think often it's one that's thrust upon us. I think we've done well. Patients with uncomplicated infarction, the data show that those below age 65, employed at the time of infarction, about 80% of them return to work, usually within a couple of months and usually with the same job. That is a good result. But once they go back to work, they don't stay at work. And that is not a medical issue. That is the pension, the retirement, the disability incentives for people to not work. I don't have problems with the low return to work with complications of infarction. Many of these people indeed are impaired. I have concern with coronary bypass surgery in that many of these people have simply decided or their physicians are often afraid to let them return to work or the system encourages them to remain unemployed. We must know the high risk profile for people not returning to work because there are one or two areas where we may intervene. Individuals unemployed more than six months are unlikely to return to work. Therefore, for patients with a chest pain syndrome, rapid evaluation and rapid therapy so that rapid return to work can be accomplished. The anxiety and depression limiting return to work. Again, we've seen how we may be able to intervene. Patients who perceive their illness as job related. And I think often unintentionally, the physician may reinforce this. And this is something that is rarely the case. But most of the time, I think we must place the responsibility where it is. And that is the financial, the social, and the disability benefits that encourage people not to return to work. We can do just a bit to return people appropriately to work. 
And going back to some old, old data on exercise testing, we realized that there is information in the literature that we should have appreciated long since. And that is that our testing for function for return to work is inappropriate. Because we see that whereas patients can do two and a half calories per minute on a continuous exercise protocol, they can do four calories of work per minute on an intermittent protocol. And comparable features for patients at lower levels of function. Work is not continuous. Have you ever seen anyone in the real world work the way they do on your treadmill? We should test patients essentially the way they work in an intermittent fashion so that we can more realistically guide their return to work. And as the social security system is going to be using functional testing as a way to evaluate impairment, the format of testing may become very important. Many years ago, there were statements that patients should be able to return to work if their average work is about 30% of their physical work capacity, and they probably can do a reasonable day's work. I think all of our relevant studies have not improved much on this delineation. The fact is that the physician can appropriately and actively play a role in encouraging return to work for patients for whom this is appropriate. Let me have these slides off and the lights on, please, and summarize. I think in the 1980s, the comprehensive care of a patient with myocardial infarction involves a number of features. It involves limiting the adverse consequences of the acute illness. It involves risk stratification so that we can try to intervene on those patients at high proximate risk. It certainly involves the application of all of the medical and surgical therapies at our disposal to limit symptoms and improve function. Including among these is risk modification. And then the classical rehabilitative approach, addressing the physiologic, the psychologic, the vocational characteristics in terms of delivering comprehensive care. Thank you very much. Go 
Factor One, in short, IGF-1, and its possible involvement in the differentiation of tissues of mesodermal origin, such as heart, muscle, liver, and other uh, and blood-forming elements. Some of you may be familiar with IGF-1, but called by different names, mattered and C. It was observed that when human insulin was treated with antibodies um, for insulin, that there was some residual um, insulin-like activity. The protein with this activity was isolated, sequenced, purified, and called IGF-1. IGF-1 is synthesized and secreted by the liver, along with its serum binding protein, and it's um, found in its inactive form, bound to this um, protein in the blood, and its active form, free from it. IGF-1 has some insulin-like activity. Kind of first slide. And this activity is due to its three-dimensional structure. There's insulin, pro-insulin, and IGF. As you can see, that the three-dimensional structure among all three of them are fairly similar. Due to this um, similarity, IGF-1 has a, a rather low, but still has an affinity for um, insulin receptors. And it's been shown by a group in Switzerland that IGF-1 shows insulin activity on cardiac and skeletal muscles. This activity is nearly comparable in effect to insulin in eliciting glucose uptake in the heart muscle. Thus, IGF-1 could have marked effects on cardiac metabolism. Our initial interest is to explore the involvement of IGF-1 in differentiation of heart and other tissues of mesodermal origin. Frasch's group in Zurich did experiments on the effects of IGF on undifferentiated chick embryo muscle cells. In the upper um, picture, these are undifferentiated myoblasts, which are precursors to the um, muscle cells in the absence of IGF-1. And in the lower picture, IGF-1 has been added to the medium and myotubes have formed. Um, this is pretty convincing evidence that IGF-1 play, does play a significant role in differentiation of embryonic tissue, uh, muscle cells, and other, and similar results have been observed um, with chondrocytes, blood-forming elements, and other tissues of uh, mesodermal origin. So, how do we as molecular biologists study IGF-1 in our lab? To answer this, I'm going to show and define for you some of the tools and recombinant DNA techniques that we use. First of all, we can isolate and purify a gene, but we need a vehicle or a, a vector in which to place it. The vectors we use are called plasmids. And this is, uh, plasmid is a double-stranded, close circle um, of double-stranded DNA. And this is how we represent it in our cartoons. Um, certain enzymes called restriction end endonucleases recognize specific sequences of bases. For instance, PS21 is a, um, an endonuclease, and it recognizes a sequence of bases, and it cuts where the arrows are to give, to linearize the plasmid and have, a, it cuts asymmetrically and gives cohesive or sticky end. There are other enzymes that um, add bases onto the ends of, of um, linearized DNA, and those are, in this instance, terminal transferase, and here we're adding Gs onto the end. Um, Let's say, um, hypothetically, this is the gene that we're interested in, and it's also linearized. We tail it with Cs, which is a complementary uh, base with G, and it has a very strong natural affinity, so that when we mix them together, um, they, the two bind and re the DNA recircularizes. The, um, if you notice, the two PST sites are, are reformed, and the point of doing this is to put it into E. coli and we can amplify um, or get a lot of copies of the gene and then we can go ahead and treat again with the PST1 and get out where we started with just a few copies and now we have many and we can work with the gene more efficiently, more effectively. Um, in, our, um, in our work, in order to control IGF-1, we're we're planning on putting it into a plasma to, that we've constructed together with Mark Tikachinsky's lab. 
and this plasma has spe um, several special features, um, which I'll point out to you right now. This this gene or this section here stands for the human metallothionine promoter sequence, um, which um, which is sensitive to heavy metals, and when like a heavy metal such as zinc is added, it binds to this site, and whatever is downstream from it is the RNA is polymerase is turned on, and, and it'll, whatever sequence will be just transcribed and into the RNA and then into protein eventually. Um, the multiple cloning site has a um, has a number of of different um, restriction sites, so that we can choose which enzyme we want to use according to what is what our gene has on either end. So in our case, the IGF-1 has PST sites on either end so that we just cut with PST and insert IGF-1 here. <coughs> the polyadenylation site here um, is sort of like a stop signal for the RNA polymerase so that if the RNA polymerase is reading along, it'll stop here and it won't continue on around the plasma because we're not really interested in that. We just want what's between the um, metallothionine and the poly A. Um, the Epstein Barr virus origin um, gene allows us to put this, insert this plasma or place it into, mama into mammalian cells and it'll propagate there. Um, and the origin of replication for E. coli is down here. So that having two different origins, we can, we can in place this um, plasma into both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. The Epstein-Barr um, nuclear antigen gene allows us to um, have the plasmid replicate epizonally, which means that it um, doesn't need to become linearized and go into the genome or to the DNA of the um, animal that we're interested in, or the cell. It, it can main, remain in the cell nucleus simply as a plasmid and replicate that way. Um, the advantage is that if we have to put it into the genome, then um, we're, we're not really sure where it ends up. And it could end up in the middle of a gene, you know, interrupt another sequence or whatever. Um, OK, there are two drug-resistant sites, ampicillin and hydromycin. And this, these are sort of selective devices. Um, the epizolin resistance uh, lets us select for bacterial cells that have taken up the plasma, and the hydromycin um, allows us to select for in eukaryotic cells. And the way we do that is um, those cells aren't naturally or um, they aren't naturally resistant to ampicillin, so that the cells that have taken up this plasma will survive when grown in um, ampicillin medium, medium that has Ampicillin and those who cells that haven't taken up the plasmid will that um, will die then, and that's the same for eukaryotic cells with the hydromycin. Um, presently, we're working on putting the plasmid I just described, or putting on uh, um, putting the plasmid and IGF-1 together and inserting the insulin growth factor gene. Um, right after the metallothionine here, so that we can control um, expression of it. Um, in our lab, we have cloned human insulin-like growth factor one. And this is the sequence that we have. It's, just, it's not really important, the detail. It's just what's important to notice is that there are two PST sites here. and. Um, so that we can put it and place it into the plasma. And there's some other restriction sites that we use for subcloning purposes. Um, the, the thing that we didn't realize is that we have the, the plasma, the gene sequence for, or the sequence for the IGF-1 gene, but we don't have a sequence for the signal peptide, which would precede the gene. And that, the purpose of the signal peptide is to let the protein, or to help the protein, once it's synthesized, um, get out of the cell. So, um, I'm going to show you very briefly and schematically how the signal peptide, or the importance of the signal peptide, 
um, here. This is a ribosome, and this is messenger RNA. And the ribosome moves along messenger RNA, so reading the code for um, protein, the protein that's coded for here, and then the, the protein is unsynthesized here. Um, the first codes that it, it reads is a signal peptide, and the, um, the signal peptide is very hydrophobic and has special properties that allow it to get into the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Um, the ribosome goes along and finishes reading off the, uh, the protein, and while it's doing that, there's a, a, an enzyme that clips off the signal peptide. The endoplasmic reticulum then acts, acts as a little carrier that moves from inside the cell to the cell membrane and, and lets the protein out of the cell. So the signal peptide, if without it, we would have um, we have the IGF-1 gene and maybe the cells would synthesize it, but we wouldn't have any way of getting it out of the cell. Um, so therefore, we, um, we synthesize, um, we have to synthesize a signal peptide or pre, pre-pro sequence. And here are three different ones, um, just to show you that they're pretty similar in amino acid um, makeup here. We chose the pre pro albumin um, signal peptide because it's so efficient in that um, albumin is secreted as fast as it's synthesized. So we thought this was a good one to go with. Um, we synthesized in such a way that it has a PST one side on one end and a BAM site on another. It's another. Uh, enzyme uh, restriction site, but here it shows that how um, the pre-pro piece fits right into the IGF-1 so that we don't have any extra um, amino acids and which could potentially um, mess up the, the protein product or whatever. Um, this is the work that I actually worked on and done, and I synthesized two pieces of the pre-pro sequence um, on the, the automatic gene, or automatic oligonucleotide sequencer, sequencer um, synthesizer, what I call the gene machine. <coughs> and I, I did half of the, the plus piece and half the minus piece, and they overlap by 15 bases so that when I mix them together, I mix them together and let them base pair, and then I added a, um, another uh, enzyme called DNA polymerase, which fills in, goes from 5' to 3' prime here and here, and dumped in a bunch of bases, and it filled up the, the, the rest of the strand. And the way I checked it is running a, a gel, electrophoretic, and um, the arrow points to a, a marker that is 118 base pairs long. This is 236, and this falls right about 125. Um, once we insert uh, the gene into Tikhachinsky's plasma, we plan to see if it's expressed in cultured mammalian cells, and so to see if this actually worked. And in long-range goals, we hope to inject this plasma into fertilized mouse eggs, implant them in a foster mother, and then feed the mother um, water that has zinc in it, and see how the, the um, IGF-1 expression is changed or altered. Um, if you remember that the IGF-1 was fused to the MT promoter. Um, in summary, by using these complicated recombinant DNA techniques, we can study the role of IGF-1 in the developmental, the developmental of mesodermal tissues, including heart muscle cells.
heard your cries upon arrival. Certainly we've all had the great privilege of listening to some marvelous, dynamic presentations which have information, facts, knowledge, excellent pedagogy, and indeed humor, not all of which was directed to me. <laughs> Dr. Body and Dr. Moyer, first of all, I want to thank you so much for all that you've done to organize this session. I want to say hello to all the fellow travelers, and by the way, each and every one of the individuals on the program have been fellow travelers. In the days of McCarthy, that was a dangerous thing to say, but today, of course, we know that literally, I can think of the various places we have shared experiences, whether it's Germany, France, Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, Tehran, Venezuela, Argentina, etc. Some places, good book states, teach us to face life with faith and courage that we may see the blessings hidden away even in its discords and struggles. USAs today have presented a fairly uniform profile, or may I should say, have presented a uniform fairly of my behavior pattern. Basically, it's been to this concept of discord, discussion, and questioning that I owe so much to my parents, my siblings, who are here, particularly my brother, Earl, for those of you who know him, you know why I say this. Questioning, this type of question, oh, so much. I owe it also to my wife and children, to my teachers, and certainly I have to refer to such towers of integrity as Dr. Harold Fogg, who was here earlier in the day, Harry Goldblatt, Howard T. Karstner, Carl Wiggers, and especially to my own boss, Louis, Louis Ann Katz. I bring this up because Dr. Katz, for a lifetime, applied Roger Bacon's method of acquiring knowledge by experiment, and in a so-called scientific connotation, by argument. Argument is not quarreling. The former, that is, by experiment in publication and books, and the latter on the printed page in the open forum of local, national, and international meetings. And Dr. Katz, I'll tell you why I portray him, Dr. Katz abhorred the concealment of ignorance by guess or hypothesis. I must confess, or admit, that I was infected by this concept long before I met Dr. Katz. It originated at home uh, with brothers and sisters, all of whom were even more vigorous in discourse, in discourse than I. And also, I was infected when I finally went to Chicago to be able to have the attitude to confront, to express doubts, to challenge, and to do this without malice. And I certainly hope, and I certainly get the sense that you in the audience many of our students and colleagues, especially the essayists, that you sense that I enjoyed the process of disagreeing, and I hope not being disagreeable. In fact, I can readily recall you did it for us, for me, the many encounters I've had with each of you in the laboratory, in the division meetings, in our own department, in seminars, in the airport, Barry, and elsewhere, and Andre New, that's at home with our brood that Dr. Body has referred to, with Mary and Kathy and David and Jonathan and Daniel and Susan and Beth and their spouses. And by the way, it's spouse, not spice. <laughs> the fact that so many of you are here today gives validity to the concept, the view of the ancient Talmudist Maimonides, who emphasized that people or men could be close personally, yet philosophically be in great disagreement. As a matter of fact, listening to Ralph Pappenbarger, it's remarkable how these encounters have brought us together when we had different views to formulate practical and reasonable consensus. I see uh, Lee Zoman, Al Caddis, and others of that group, Bob Bruce, not here, Sam Fox, Henry Taylor, Lloyd Brock, for example, when we met in different cities, the so-called exercise gang, where we usually sat down to discuss and try to arrive at certain concepts to be eventually producing some handbooks for the American Heart Association on Exercise for Normals and Cardiacs. I can also mention such discussions at the international meetings of the Scientific Council of the Rehabilitation of the International Society of Cardiology, at which Nanette is currently present. I wish to emphasize that we rarely quarrel Mary tells me I don't pronounce that correctly. Quarrel or quarrel. 
the 13th century Ephesus, Asher ben Yekel said, be not ready to quarrel. Avoid oaths and passionate abjurations. Avoid excesses of laughter and outbursts of wrath. They disturb and confound the reason of people. Avoid all dealings where there is a lie. Put no one to shame. Do not struggle vainly, vainly and gloriously for the small triumph of showing yourself in the right and a wise man in the wrong. And I certainly hope uh, that you have a feeling that I did not do it to you. I feel privileged to have been here in the School of Medicine, which toughened me uh, for the forthcoming war experiences that Rene Malino referred to in Normandy in the Battle of the Bulge, later in training in Philadelphia, Chicago, Michigan, and subsequently back in Cleveland. This toughened me for the survival in academia. I'm also grateful to have been able to partake in the new attitude of the medical school, far different from the morass of Western Reserve University School of Medicine in the ancient days prior to World War II. And the individuals like Norman Hurd, Jack Coy, Carol File, humanists who made it possible to mature. And also, I'm grateful to have been a part of the development of the concepts so elegantly presented by you, the essays on cardiac rehabilitation, comprehensive medical care, and cardiology. I'm also grateful for you for not only sharing the past experiences, but also for being here today because you have left your busy homes, your active practices, your families to come to Cleveland, which by chance today had sunshine. <laughs> now, in the book, the, uh, Judson's book on the eighth day of creation, which Beth brought to my attention, and just as I read the funnies, as David has said in some articles, I've always read the funnies to keep up with what the kids are reading. So I started to read Judson's book, The Eighth Day of Creation, which talks about DNA, etc. because certainly I can't afford to be too ignorant about the frontiers that she's working in. And in this book, Lebov said, the art of research starts with finding oneself a bon patron, a good boss. I found one in many places, but particularly in Chicago with Louis Katz. My scientific boss Katz once said that his greatest accomplishment was his ability to choose fellows to whom he could teach a bit and from whom he could learn a lot. To paraphrase, not only did I find a good boss, but actually many good bosses, but even more importantly I found, by chance, by design, and serendipity, you good colleagues from whom I can learn and with whom we can mutually mature, literally resolving many conflicts in the process. Last but not least, who is worthy of honor? So stated Ben Isaiah in the year 185. He stated, he who respects his fellow man, as it is said, for them that honor me, I will and do honor, here and now. And here I now wish to put, state my honor feeling toward you good colleagues, Bob Body, Bill Moyer, Bill Insel, Renee Malineau, Bill Haskell, Ralph Pappenbarger, John Naughton, Tom Hackett. I know you can read the program, Barry Franklin, Annette Winger, and last but not least, Beth Hellerstein. That last reference reminds me, in some writings called The Saints of the Father, Elisha said, if one learns as a child, what is it like? Well, it's like ink that's written on a clean piece of paper. If one learns as an old man, what is it like? It's like ink written on a blot of paper. We will and can learn, as obvious from the last presentation, from the young. He who learns from the young, what is he like? He's like to one who eats unripe grapes and drinks wine from the vat. Now I must say, perhaps filled with DNA. <laughs> and he who learns from the old, to what is he like? to one who eats ripe grapes, or drinks old wine, or other intoxicants. Thank you very much.